Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. I'm excited today because I've got somebody who is with us today that's an American film actor and he's known for Crisis in the Valley, Taken Over, and Acts of Violence. This is really exciting because he's going to talk to us a little bit about each one of those and we're going to get some insight. It's really exciting because after high school he joined the army and I really love this. What's exciting is he's a he was a helicopter mechanic and this takes him to where he's at today. And we're gonna talk about that too. Why? Because there's a lot of excitement in those two things. He eventually applied for and was accepted into the Rotary Wing Flight School and he earned his flight wings. Something not too many people can say and many of you may, when you go in the air, hope to get some flight wings from one of the major airlines. And I don't know, maybe sometimes when you were a little kid, you were hoping to get a little pair, but he really did. And he has been utilizing them for the purpose of good. It's super exciting. But after multiple overseas deployments, including those to Iraq and Afghanistan, he decided to officially retire after 23 and a half years. And that is so dedicated uh, service to our country. It's super amazing. A lot of times, those of us who are veterans, we put our time in and then we often go to put our service into another profession. Sometimes it's law enforcement and sometimes it's to another service field and sometimes it's to start our career in another field. But this is a dedication that he's continued on into a service for our country in another area. And I've got to tell you, when he's not on the film set, he's working in life flight. What an honor. He's doing this as a heli helicopter pilot. And we are really going to talk a lot about that because I can't tell you how immensely of an honor this is because those of us who have ever had to experience that for ourselves or for our loved ones are absolutely grateful for that. His breakout film was a supporting role as Anthony King in an independent project, Crisis in the Valley. He's since been cast in numerous independent and commercial projects, including a YouTube science fiction web series, Cold Blooded, and he played Dr. Bradley. He also has 10 credits known, and you can find that out on his IMDb page. But let's let him talk to us a little bit more today. So I'd like to welcome him to the show. Welcome, Stephen P. Ham. Hey, Rebecca. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Thank you, and thank you for your service to our country and your service for what you're doing now and for the laughter and um, all of the attention that we get to give you while you're on screen. So thank you. You're welcome and thanks for your service as well. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> so I am absolutely ecstatic to have you on the show because we have a lot to talk about and I want to talk about first, how did you go from high school into deciding to serve the country? Well, um, <laughs> Basically, uh, I guess I have my dad to thank for that, or uh, actually he was the, uh, the driving force. Um, he was uh, an Air Force veteran himself. He did four years, uh, then got out and uh, he became a uh, mailman. But uh, I think because of him and his interest in, in, in the military and things of that nature, um, besides I did uh, four years of a high school ROTC as well. So I guess you'd say I was groomed into the military uh, service way of life. And uh -huh. he actually wanted me to uh, the, uh, service academies, but uh, being a rebellious little teenager, of course, my, uh, my grades weren't always the best. So I think that was kind of a hindrance to, to getting in. And it was something that he wanted, I think probably more than I wanted. So um, 
realizing that that wasn't going to happen for me and I really wasn't going to be ready for the college experience. I just, to me, it was more of a military mindset. So, you know, upon graduation, I did uh, enlist and uh, initially started to a helicopter mechanic, um, which was a good gig. I mean, not many people can say that they've done that. So it was interesting. And then, of course, uh, after about six years of doing that, you hang around pilots, you see them take off after you've done work, and you hear them talk about their story, you know, with their training or things that they've done. You get bitten by that bug. Um, so the Army does have a program where you can apply for flight training and uh, at any rank. And so I did. And I was fortunate enough to get uh, selected the first time around. And uh, the rest was history for me after that. So it was uh, one of the best decisions I've made. Uh, I enjoy flying. It's, it's, it's incredible. I mean, there's nothing else like it. And to me, you know, flying helicopters is totally different than, you know, flying a, a, a fixed wing airplane. Um, it's just, uh, there's more going on. There's more you got to do. A little more uh, uh, coordination, I guess you could say, is the right word for it. So, Well, that's interesting. Um, it takes time to develop those skills, but uh, it's, yeah, it, uh, there's, you, you can't go from flying a helicopter to flying a plane uh, there's just it's it's night and day difference so i mean you have to have a license for an airplane anyway and a different license for a helicopter pilot so you can't just go from one to the other i mean and you have to keep up all your training you know there's uh, evaluation that you're required to uh to take um, and that depends if you're you know instrument qualified or not so um there's a lot of that but uh i do have a, an inclination to try to get my my fixed wing license as well but just not at this present time I think that that is really something that maybe most of us would not know. And the assumption would be that because this is a smaller craft, that you would have less to know or less to learn to fly it. <laughs> and that's not the case. No, it's not. Um, the hardest thing in flight school, anyone will tell you, is probably a little learning to, to hover the, the, uh, the helicopter and uh, find your proverbial uh, hover buttons, what they call it. So, you know, you got uh, the th uh, three different uh, controls to deal with, you know, the, the cyclic, which, you know, is right in front of you that deals with, you know, forward and back and left and right movement. You got your collective, which is usually on your left, which is on your left side that deals with, you know, uh, taking the, the helicopter up and down. And then you got that small rotor in the back called the tail rotor. So that controls your, your, uh, your yaw of the aircraft, basically your side is uh, the pivoting motion. And so there's pedals on the floor that you have to use, you know, with pressure and counter pressure to keep uh, a certain heading, if you would call it so. So you have all these, these three things going on. And the problem is that, you know, when you try to get it picked up to hover in the first place is, is interesting because there's a torque issue factor you have to uh, uh, get you know about and have to uh, counteract that as well. But once you get up in the air or get to a hover, trying to calm yourself down so you don't over control it, which is what at first does they over control it. And, you know, it starts off very small, but after every over controlling movement, the aircraft just almost spins out of control and, you know, bad things can happen. That's why you go up with an instructor, you know, and they can catch it before it gets too far, you know, but you only start with one control at a time, basically until you can figure it out. So for me, they said, okay, use the pedals and I want you to, you know, be on this heading, let's say, you know, it's to the west, so 270 or whatever. So I want you to keep the pedals and keep the heading within 10 degrees. And once you can do that, they'll give you the collective. And they want, okay, I want you to maintain, you know, plus or minus 10 feet. So you, once you get that down with the pedals, then they give you the cycle. Like, okay, I want you to maintain with a certain, you know, distance from where we are right now. And it just, after a while, it just, I guess it comes to you. You just relax. And once you have that done, the rest of it is actually... A lot easier. <laughs> so my heart is just, you know, racing, thinking about the tail end and spinning around. What's really interesting is just recently I had my first opportunity to fly in a helicopter, which was very exciting for me. I see. And well, I took my grandson for a little trip at this little event that we went to, and it has been the talk. Every, you know, all the time now that grandma and grandson has been, you know, going on this is, is something now that we're going to make it a tradition to do that we, you know, my grandson and I go on this helicopter ride. 
pretty exciting. Um, I, I was just jazzed to be in there. I, I thought that um, it was an amazing experience. And even if I could go solo in there, I think that I would, I'm, I love to learn. So I'm thinking about how much yeah. I could learn just by watching. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to go and try to fly myself, but I think it would be an opportunity to really absorb a lot of things from many different perspectives. And it, it was an amazing experience. So just from that statement that I made, let me ask you this. If someone were getting ready to embark on going into learning how to fly, is it very expensive to do and would it be better to maybe enlist in the military so that they could learn to fly? Maybe, would that be a better type of training? Um, well, I would kind of be biased to say that, yeah, I think the military side has better quality training per se. Mm -hmm. um, however, on the civilian side, I mean, obviously with the military, if the training is paid for. I mean, you sign a contract to go in and, you know, depending on how long your contract is. And uh, flight school is usually between nine months long for, for the military. But, okay. you know, you're not just learning your, your basic flying and your instrument skills. You're learning, learning a bunch of uh, combat skills as well as it relates to the service. So there's a lot more that goes into that. Um, but on the civilian side, a helicopter license is more expensive to get. Um, it's, I think it costs more per hour to, to go up with an instructor um, than it does for an airplane. Uh, so with an airplane, you know, it pretty much flies itself. I mean, once you can get it off the ground, it's designed to fly. A helicopter is not. I mean, the helicopter, as they say, it beats the air into submission. So uh, you just you have to get the coordination going. And, you know, depending on how much money you have available, you know, you're spending, let's say, you know, average $150, $200 an hour. And depending on how many hours it takes you to, you know, settle down and to get comfortable with it, you know, then once you can do it, then you go on to your next lesson. But with an airplane, yeah, it flies on its own. And uh, I think it's probably a lot shorter time to, to learn everything with that. So oh. with the military, yeah, it's, uh, you also have the military commitment as well and everything that goes with the military as an institution. So if you want to put up with that, then be my guest. Well, yeah, I mean, just, I, I would never trade the skills that I learned ever have, you know, being a veteran myself, looking back, even though it was an arduous amount of training that I did, yeah. I would never trade it for the world. Um, no, I totally agree. Yeah. Um, I, I learned from some of the really best instructors that I think that, you know, this kind of offer and, uh, you know, they all had their little, uh, Tip, tips and advice that they, that they share with you and you just collect, you know, what you feel works for you and you come up with your own system of how things work. So um, I definitely, you know, you can, I think a lot of the med crew I work with in my, in my job, they can tell the difference between the civilian pilots and the military pilots, just, uh, you know, just how we function essentially, you know, and, and what we do. So it's, I have a hard time seeing it, but uh, they, they definitely, they can tell. That's pretty interesting. So let's talk a little bit about you working in the industry you do now as a civilian uh, life light pilot, because I can only imagine how intense this is um, in comparison. I, you know, I know that after 23 years that you have seen some stuff in Afghanistan and, and Iraq both. And um, without really going back to a lot of things that happened at that time. I want to talk about what you're doing now because what you're doing now is very profound. And a lot of those listeners and those viewers that we have, those are really things that can hit home with them in their own community. And they're seeing things on television. They're hearing things on the radio. And a lot of that there is really personal, very, very personal, um, as opposed to things that they don't see um, as often or can really understand. And once we can apply that here, they'll have a better understanding of those that have gone overseas and have risked their life. And so can you talk a little bit about what you do? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm one of the uh, pilots for the company and, uh, we're on call 24, seven, 365, regardless. 
Um, the only, uh, I think, limiting factor for us to take a flight is mainly the weather. I have to keep an eye on that all the time. And uh, yeah, usually the weather is the biggest thing. Um, that and, of course, you know, um, the amount of flight time we can do in one day. So unless there is a, a natural disaster going on, you know, other than COVID, obviously, but uh, that's we'll, we'll never reach the eight, the eight hours that we're limited to. So, but yeah, so we, you know, we get a call and the industry now is that they call you to see if you can accept a flight from one spot to another or to a scene, you know, that someone got injured in uh, to someplace else and you, you get no other information. So my job is to check the weather and to make sure that, you know, the weather is good for me to get to the word or the scene call and then get to the destination and get back home without the weather affecting us. And if I can do that, then I'd tell them, yes, we can, we can take this, this flight. Well, after that, then the patient information is, uh, is um, sent over to the med crew. Um, because in the past, you know, whether, you know, if, if it's like, if you were told to uh, pay ahead of time, in the past, it was known that you could make a decision whether or not you wanted to go or not, depending on the, how bad the weather was, if you felt it was important enough to go or not, which is the wrong answer, but that's the way it was. So now we make our decisions based on weather alone, basically, essentially. So they, they get the patient info, and uh, we try to do our best to get off the ground within uh, 10 minutes of the call. And then uh, we get there, and if it's a, you know, most of our flights are usually inner facility, which means from hospital to hospital. Okay. And uh we get there and uh, the crew uh, goes in there and they do their assessment and they take over care. And, you know, these people are, are you know, tremendous <laughs> at, their, at their job. You know, at least 10 years of ER experience minimum, you know, for some. Others have ICU experience, but they have rigorous training and that they just, they're expert. So they go in there, they assess the patient, they get them what we call packaged up for flight. And then I do whatever I can to assist in that to a point, obviously. I have no medical training knowledge not required so um, my main thing is just to be able to transport the whole crew with the patient safely to the destination and uh, I mean it, it gets different especially for uh, a scene call where you have to if there's you know an auto accident on the highway or something um, of course in Ohio it's pretty uh, wooded out here in some areas so people go out there and when it's summertime they ride ATVs and stuff like that without helmets on you know get into an accident hurt their head or gotten you have to go out there, you know, and the fire department responds first, of course. And once they, they need us, they set up what's called an LZ, a landing zone. And it's usually like four cones or, or four items that mark the, the LZ. And it could be anywhere in the field, you know, just anywhere, basically. And we have to, we have to contend with, um, you know, the weather, obviously. Hopefully it's, you know, it's good enough to fly. Um, any uh, obstacles that are being away, it's like towers and antennas. Um, stuff like that, especially that's the biggest thing I got to worry about. So um, in the daytime, it's not that hard to deal with all that because you can see everything. But now at nighttime presents a whole entire new uh, set of challenges. Now we do fly with night vision goggles. Uh, okay. So that's a plus. Um, so, you know, at nighttime when you get there and depending on how bright the night is, pretty much relies on uh, where the moon is in the sky. So if it's you know, pretty decent high in the sky, then it's almost like when you have the goggles on, looking at, at, at a pure, a sunny day almost per se, which helps a lot to identify obstacles. Now, if it's not that high yet, then it's still kind of dark out there, but the goggles do provide it for you to kind of get an idea of, of what you're getting into. So, okay. but you know, I confirm with the crew, go ahead. Let me just jump in right there and ask you, you mentioned with the moon, and the calls yep. for service at night. So what I'd like to know is, are there, is they on a full moon, more calls for service that you get? <laughs> um, some have that, uh, that idea that that could happen. I mean, I, I, it is it's kind of coincidence. I'm not really sure how the full moon would, would uh, influence uh, people going a little bit nuttier than, than usual. Um, <laughs> I, it, it's, if it does happen, I think it's more of a, of a coincidence, uh, essentially, but normally like holiday weekends when a lot of people are out drinking, you can almost guarantee, you know, a higher call volume just because that's what happens, you know. Um, people are human and human nature takes over when you get alcohol and, you know, you start driving or even when you don't drive, you do other things that, that hurt you. So 
but no, I don't think there's a correlation with that. I mean, it's probably superstition. So, but yeah, it's cool that we get to use the goggles. It definitely helps out at nighttime. Um, and yeah, I've, I've seen some stuff and I'll mention one thing that, that has hit me hard when I first started actually, I think it was within the first year or two of my starting in this, um, it was actually a Sunday morning and I had just taken over on the day shift and we got a call about a, uh, a uh, fire that had happened not too far away from us. And so we get to the hospital and to make this long story short, basically, um, there was a, uh, it was a trailer fire and mom was, and uh, dad. So there was this, this uh, trailer fire that happened one morning and we get called and uh, I get there and it was well, you know, basically uh, at work and dad was at home with the kids and I believe they were all about less than 10. So we got called for a, uh, a trailer fire uh, and we uh, get to the hospital to wait for the patients to arrive. And as long as it was a uh, to, to do anything enough to, to help everyone out, but all the kids uh, died of smoking mission. So, uh, I was in shock when I heard it and didn't believe it at first. But, you know, when you look at the doctor and the nurses' expressions and you're like, oh, this is real. And then seeing one of the nurses, you know, literally carrying out one of the kids from the, you know, the, the room and just, you know, covered it in black, basically lifeless. And, and, you know, you knew they were going down the morgue. And it's just like, I have kids of my own. So it just, it hits you, hits you hard at home for that. And I just, I couldn't believe it. And uh, come to find out at the end of that day, though, that I think two of the nurses at the hospital had quit that day because they just, uh, they couldn't deal with it anymore. That was too much for them. And mm -hmm. you would think, you know, we're nurses that see a lot, but, you know, we see stuff like that. That's, that's horrible. And then the mom finds out, you know, when she's at work that all her kids are, have, you know, passed away. She wasn't even there to, to see them or do anything about it. I mean, that's, that's really, that's hard hitting. So, um, that one sticks with me pretty, pretty good. Um, I actually, when I got back to the base, you know, um, I talked with the, uh, the nurse we had and the medic that was there cause they'd been doing this for a while. And, you know, they, we just talked it out just to get out in the open and to deal with it. And then called my kids, uh, right after that. And just to say, you know, kind of, here's what happened, you know, I love you guys. And, uh, so that the top of my, my hard hitting uh, list of stuff that I've, I've dealt with it that hits close to home and you feel very bad for the mom having to deal with all that and it's the whole family um, so I mean I it's nothing you want to hear about unfortunately you know it it, it happens so but other than that yeah everything else we deal with um, we kind of talked about this before is that you kind of almost become numb to it because you see it so often and uh, you, you you just put in different apartments in your brain and, and you move on but you got to find a way to um to deal with it and when you're off of work you know do something that you know get your mind off of it and, and put you back into you know a good frame of mind so I have hobbies that you know i do off, off of work that that keep me from, from thinking about stuff that happens on the job so what you said <clears throat> is really important and i really want the audience to absorb this and keep this in their mind and in their heart because through life and part of life there is going to be trauma this is a fact and what we need to do is realize that we have to find the good part and keep that in our mind so that we can move through these things that are going to happen and it is really important to do that and another thing that you mentioned is that you went home and you talked to your children about these things and so um, why is this important it is important because when we experience something one um, our family members can know that we're human too but another thing is we can put an action plan into place on how we want to interact with our family so that we can always be sure that we show and 
let the other one know that we love each other. So if something does happen, that they can rest assured that that love is there in the event something does happen. So there's strategies that we can put in place to sort of help us get through different situations when things do occur and they're going to occur. And oftentimes when situations happen that mental health things take place like anxieties um, manifest, oftentimes they come because we aren't prepared when certain, certain situations strike us. And we can't always be prepared for them, but we can be prepared no. for the best of it. And, right. you know, ahead of time by learning co good coping skills along the way. And so I think that that was something that you took from a, a learning standpoint and your children now are going to be able to remember that and they will then um, emulate those things in them from what you did. And oh, absolutely. That's really yeah. Important. That's a really important point. So um, I really, uh, I'm sorry that you had to see that and go through that. And for those family, that family um, that experienced that and all of the workers surrounding that, I am really thankful that you are doing what you do. One of the questions that I have, and I'm not sure, maybe some of the others that are listening are wondering how far do you fly? I mean, what is the uh, furthest distance that you are allowed to go from one place to another? Well, our, uh, our main uh, limiting thing is the amount of fuel that we can take on board. So uh, basically, I have about, I'd say, an hour and 45 minutes of fuel uh, at the most, really, to get anywhere. So, excuse me. I was getting a little teary-eyed from the uh, the previous story. So, um, so I uh, so that's okay. Um, I... I tend to can, can be an emotional type of guy at times. So uh, this job, you know, it's, you try not to show any, uh, you know, um, too much tears and stuff, especially when you're dealing with patients and their families, you know, you got to show the, the strength, you know, and, and the compassion that's needed in those, in those types of situations. So um, I, I learned that from the, the med crew as well. You know, you go in there and you show compassion and you show, you know, uh, professionalism and, you know, that's what they'll remember and take away from it, if nothing else. So, but uh, no, from where I'm stationed at or where I work out of um, the main hospital is in Toledo and I can fly uh, anywhere far, as far out west as uh, uh, Fort Wayne, Indiana um, to uh, northern parts of Michigan sometimes um, okay. out to, to the east to Cleveland normally as far as I go. Uh, we can go down to Akron sometimes or down to Columbus. So our base is centrally located in that whole area um, and uh, we have uh, four... Well, let's see. One main base in, in Toledo, and then we have uh, three other bases um, that can service uh, the whole entire area. So, and we also have uh, mobile ground units that go around as well for to transfer patients that don't quite meet the uh, the flight necessity. So, are you similar to then like the fire department, where you stay at one location for two or three days at one time, or? Um, no, um, we don't do that. Um, <laughs> I do a uh, seven week hitch as they call it. So my, uh, my seven days incorporates a uh, three day shifts and then I transition to nights Then I do four night shifts in a row. Um, we don't stay at the base. Um, the pilots only do 12 hour shifts. So I'm usually 7.30 to 7.30 and then when I'm done with my shift, I go home. Um, okay. Once my seven days are over with, then I'm off for a week. So Oh, wow. It's a nice schedule. It's nice and flexible. So you find hobbies to do when you're off time, you know, uh, whatever it is, you know. So I take up, you know, I do golfing when I can. I watch movies. I do acting when I can. And my this work schedule can hinder it sometimes, although it is flexible. But uh, you just do things to get your mind off of work and to fill up your, 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 the void. So, so but the, go ahead. Let's, let's take your mind off of what we were just talking about and let's do talk about the opportunity that you do have with acting because you're an incredible actor and you're doing incredible <laughs> Thanks. Things. You're welcome. You're welcome. So um, let's do talk about that because I want to talk about some of the work that you have done. And the first thing that we did talk about 
Um, and I, I'm, I'm really excited about this because you you mentioned you did. Well, let's let me let me backtrack it, and we kind of work backwards a little bit. We talked about the last thing we, in the introduction was a web series that you did. So let's talk about that first. Okay. Um, so uh, through the uh, website backstage is where I saw this uh, casting call for, and they were looking for a uh, a guy to play a father slash a doctor essentially. So, which I can fill that, 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 uh, that character type. Um, so I, I submitted my stuff and after a few callbacks, um, got selected and this was filming in New York. So I was really excited about that as well. Oh, that um, is so flew out there. Um, we shot the scene or just, uh, scenes basically. And, uh, it was, it was, a, you know, a long day. I mean, I, I was there for about three days, you know, the travel day, the shooting day, and then you leave the next day essentially. So, but it was, it was interesting to be part of, of that production. And unfortunately um, being with indie films, you know, uh, finance or trying to finance a project is the hardest thing. So the director, she had, you know, uh, scripts written out for an entire season basically, but I think she was having problems trying to keep funding going. So we actually only shot one episode. And uh, I haven't, you know, heard back from anything since. So I'm, I got a feeling that it, it's kind of like on the back burner or maybe just, you know, dropped off. I'm not really sure, but that happens in this business too. So, but I was fortunate enough and, you know, felt grateful enough to, to get cast in that and to be a part of that. So um, that was, that was an interesting experience. I enjoyed that. Sometimes it takes a little while before things, uh, you know, come popping up to the surface and uh, get picked up with, Amazon Prime or Hulu or Netflix and um, yeah. just working out those little bit of details. So it's kind of exciting. We can watch for you and that um, is Dr. Bradley. I'm super excited to see that when it comes out. But you were Anthony King also in Crisis. Um, in yes. The so talk to me a little bit about that. Oh man, that, uh, that was actually my first uh, speaking role in the film. And uh, I've tried not to make this draw, dra uh, drag this out too long. Basically, um, I had seen, I was on going through Facebook one night and a friend of mine who's in the film, or it, actually she was in a previous film of this director. She uh, had made a post about it and about a different film. And I commented saying, hey, congrats on the role or congrats on this or that, um, you know, which is what, you know, you should do with your colleagues, you know, always congratulate them for whatever castings they get or what they're involved in. I mean, that's what you, you support each other in this business. So I made a comment. And next thing you know, I get contacted by the director. He said, I saw your comment and you fit the bill for this character that I'm trying to replace because he had lost his original cast member for this. And I was like, oh, really? And so, you know, he told me what the premise was and what the character was calling for. And I was a little bit apprehensive because he's like, okay, so he's a white guy. Um, he can be very vulgar, you know, with women and the way he talks and a bunch of other things. So I was a little bit apprehensive. I said, well, send me the script and let me see what happens. So he, he sent it to me and I read through it and I was like, okay. But when you're young and you want to be in a film, you almost pretty much accept almost anything that comes your way because you want to get experience and do the film. So I'm like, sure, I can do this. So I drove all the way out there and we shot the scene and uh, um, it <laughs> it was interesting. I, I would never speak to a woman like that ever, even though this woman played my sister. Um, so, but uh I think that the biggest thrill or shock I had was when we went to the theater for the first premiere and I sat there and I was watching myself on the big screen in the scene. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm on the screen. And I just, I mean, the emotions that came over me were just, I was in shock. I was excited. I just didn't know what to say. And uh, I was just, it was, it was a thrill, but yeah. Um, you just never know when opportunities that come your way to be part of something, especially off of, you know, responding to the Facebook posts of all things. So but uh, the director was David Walker, um, Crisis in the Valley. He actually made a sequel to it as well. Um, he's part of Walk Star Productions. And uh, I mean, great director. He's got a whole bunch of uh, uh, films, projects under his belt. So, uh, you know, he's, he's an up and comer for sure. So I was grateful to be, uh, to be a part of that. Well, that's exciting. Uh, maybe we will see you in some more of his films. Talk to me too about Taking Over. Taking Over, uh, taking over um, that was a Michigan project, any film again. And, uh, I uh, end up being a, uh, a neighbor basically. And my job was to uh, tackle one of the, uh, the main stars. She was about to uh, kill my neighbor actually. So 
Uh, we, I just went up there and we spent a few hours just going over the scene and I had to literally physically tackle her to the ground. So um, it wasn't much to it. Um, more of an extra type of role, essentially no speaking, just, you know, going through the, uh, the, the motions of the action. So, but, you know, you're still on a film set, you get to, to do something. And uh, the film actually got renamed to uh, called Enigma and it got picked up by a distributor. So um, I love it. You know, it, it's out there. Uh, the director is uh, uh, Harley Wallen. So you can look him up on Facebook and IMDb. Uh, he's, he's done several indie projects as well. He's a great director. I absolutely love it. Now, I know you've got 10 credits to your name and we've only got a short amount of time. So I'm gonna to talk to you about the last title of Act of Violence. And I would assume now that there might have, so this would might be some military um, connections here, but maybe I'm wrong. Talk to me. Well, no, um, <laughs> that one was a, uh, I got lucky on that one as well, which tends to be my luck sometimes. Um, so I saw a casting call. They were looking for people to portray extras as either uh, FBI agents, um, EMTs, uh, law enforcement of some sort, anything in that arena. So um, it was for a night shoot. And I was like, well, I'm off that day, uh, which was be, could be the next day. So I actually it was that night, actually. So I sent my stuff and they're like, yeah, we like what you got. So come on down. So I did. And I had stuff set up to be a, uh, an FBI agent, basically, or okay. no, I'm sorry, detective, that's what it was. So I get down there and we do all our paperwork and we get sent to the, uh, the set. And, you know, it's supposed to be the final scene of the movie. Um, and me and this other lady who are playing detectives are on the sidewalk and we're given a notepad and said, OK, pretend you're taking notes because a big shootout just happened. I'm like, OK, great. And we're standing there. And next, thing you know, the same assistant that put us there said, hey, come with me. Next thing you know, they take us to the porch of the house and I see a couple or a few of the, the main actors from the actual movie there. I was like, wow, this is interesting. I didn't really, really realize what was happening at the time, but come to find out that the director had decided that he was going to have detectives uh, escort these actors out because it was just a finish of a gunfight and basically, you know, they broke the law. So uh, the main actor on the show, Cole Hauser, uh, <laughs> was there and my job was to, oh. he was getting was to escort him out the, uh, the out of the house after the firefight. So um, I was the first one out the door with him. And what's really cool was that, you know, we did the take, I don't know, like five or 10 times because there was a winter storm coming in, but you, you walk outside the door and there is a drone camera in front of you that's filming for an overhead shot. You've got two other camera operators, A and B at the bottom of the steps, you know, and basically one camera is for uh, looking at him. The other camera is portraying where Bruce Willis is supposed to be. So he knows where to look, how to do his subtle nod. And then you walk across the grass, you know, and get him in the squad car. So that was my, it was, went from an extra to a featured extra for that. It. Just at, you know, just in a matter of seconds, you know, I was like, wow, this is a really cool experience. So um, yeah, that was one, definitely a career highlight. I absolutely love it. This is really exciting. You have a lot of, amazing things that you're doing not only are they really contributing some wonderful things to the community in a very profound way that are on an intense level but they're intense on screen and I'm really excited about the things that you're doing and I I absolutely want to help you any way that I can I'm, I'm absolutely grateful that you have taking the time to be here on the show and share with us the things that you have. I am, I am just overwhelmed with delight. So thank you. Oh, no, I mean, the pleasure is all mine. Trust me. I, I appreciate you taking the time to, to interview me. Uh, you know, I, I don't look for, you know, uh, for these kind of things myself. You know, I, I get on social media, I interact with people as much as I can. And I've taken tips and advice from other you know, industry professionals of how, how to, uh, you know, the promoter interact with others. Um, so, and yeah, no, I'm totally grateful. Um, you know, in addition to all this stuff too, as I discussed with you before on our previous phone calls is that, you know, not only the acting thing, when, you, when there's not much that going around, then, you know, I'm also pursuing my, uh, get a license to, uh, to sell real estate. So hopefully that gets done or I can take my test next month and get licensed to do that. Plus I'm also editing in an audiobook as well. So I'm kind of, the things that I didn't get a chance to do when I was in the service, I'm trying to, to, to pursue now, just trying to see how I like them and how it goes. So I got my plate full along with, you know, trying to get some golf in and watching movies or whatever kind of flows my boat at the time. So I'm just, you know, kind of all around. But, you know, when I'm doing a job, I am focused. I am dedicated. I'm a professional. 
will get the best work out of me. And uh, I mean, I like to as well. So I mean, I'm not just all, you know, Mr. Straight and Narrow. I mean, I do like to have fun as well. I absolutely love the things that you are saying. You're a great example to those that are listening because you're pursuing things. You're trying new interests. And I want the audience to follow you. I think you are someone that those that are looking for a mentor, someone that can they can emulate. You are a shining example. They should connect with you <laughs> on social media. Oh, I do. And um, I that's, <laughs> appreciate the compliment. That's well, I mean, that's that's uh, I'm humbled by it. Well, look, that look actually, at, um, look at what you do. all I can say is for people that if it's you want to so oh, go ahead, great choices, and you have done wonderful things for the community, and now you are in a position where you are taking an opportunity of now looking at uh, other things and you are enjoying life at the same time and if you're in the ohio area and want to buy a house this is the man that you need to see in addition to watching him on <laughs> right other yeah things. right yeah okay. so this is what this is what i'd like you for all of those of you who are watching and listening to the show I would like you to connect with Stephen P. Ham because this is the man. Tell them where they can contact you at. Uh, if you can go to my website, www.steveham.org, um, it'll take you to my official site. It has links to all my uh, platforms as well, so it's a one-stop shop for everything. So that's the best place to go. Thank you. I love it. I love it. Thank you. And I want to thank all of you for... <laughs> Tuning in to another episode of Rebecca Sounds Revely. I am just so jazzed about this show because I think this is an opportunity for you to have an absolutely fantastic connection and someone who is an absolutely outstanding, as we say in the military, outstanding example of someone. So for all of those of you who want to connect, absolutely connect with him. I want to thank you for tuning in. Make sure that you like the show, subscribe, do all of those things. I want you to share the show with everybody that you know and everyone you don't. Thanks for tuning in.